Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. The last time I was in Pierce, uh, my, my kids uh, got beat up on the basketball court by the, by the Pierce home team. So uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Fargo. I, was a, I have a conflict of interest to disclose. I, I went to University of North Dakota, but I grew up in Fargo, so that makes me a Bison fan. I'm an NDSU fan kind of through and through. Um, excited to be here today to talk about a, 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 a couple different topics. We're going to talk a li about heart disease and the differences between men and women. And we're going to talk about uh, a couple different uh, heart diseases that can affect uh, men and women a little differently. Um, so I'm part of Minneapolis Heart Institute. We have an outreach clinic in Baxter, Crosby, and Aiken. Um, very proud to be working there. We're very, we have an excellent team of, of uh, physicians, nurses, uh, and, and staff there. A uh, couple bragging points. I've got to do some, a little bit of bragging here. Not about myself, but uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute, we're ranked number 27 in the country on the most recent U.S. News and World Report. So we're very happy and, and proud about that. And we um, just started a, a journal. So we have a, a journal that we publish every uh, twice a year so far, and we'll probably end up going to a quarterly uh, about every three months or so. Uh, to help uh, disseminate and spread some of the, the uh, research that we do at, at uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute. So I always like to start off with a quote. I, I had the, the honor of, of not personally meeting the Dalai Lama, but hearing him speak when I was uh, training at Mayo Clinic. And he, he has, a, has a great quote about mosquitoes. And I think it's appropriate because we live in the land of 10,000 mosquitoes, or probably more than that. But if you think you're too small to make a difference, Try sleeping in a room with a mosquito. And, and as everybody knows, that mosquito will find you no matter what. So we've got some objectives to cover today. We're going to re review the differences in heart disease between men and women. We're going to recognize and appreciate some of the heart attack signs and symptoms. And then we're going to discuss ways to decrease our risk of coronary artery disease, among other things. And we'll talk a little bit uh, also about different different things that can affect men and women differently from a heart disease standpoint. So, some heart diseases are more common in women. Women have additional risk factors for coronary disease that we'll dive into. And then, some women, men and women can respond differently to medications. So we don't have a one-size-fits-all when we talk about heart disease in, in various different, different areas of heart, of heart cardiovascular diseases. But we do know that heart disease is very common, both in men and women. It affects about one in four women uh, who pass away from heart disease, from a heart attack or other various forms of heart disease. It's the number one killer in men and women. So heart disease does not discriminate between men and women. It, affects all, it can affect all of us equally. Uh, women tend to have develop coronary disease about 10 years later than men. And death rates have decreased in both men and women, but uh, it hasn't decreased as much in women. And so we have, we have some work to do there because historically speaking, a lot of the old research trials that, we, that have been performed across the U United States and the world haven't enrolled as many women and, and men, especially back in the 1980s and 1990s. And nowadays, uh, we know that, that, that when we try to take that information and generalize it to men and women, that data hasn't, hasn't been as helpful. And so now, nowadays, research trials really work hard to try to encourage men and women to participate. And it's really important because it affects men and women, this, this, uh, this heart disease. So I'm going to refer to a couple different handouts throughout the talk. The first handout I'm going to talk about is the heart itself. Now I'm a big fan of anatomy, and, and when we talk about the heart, this is a picture of your heart. Your heart is a pump that's about the size of your fist, and it sits a little bit off-center to the left. It's got four chambers to it. The upper chambers are called atria, these upper chambers here, and those mainly function to receive blood from the body and the lungs and push the blood down to the lower chambers, which are really the workhorses of the heart called the ventricles, and there's a left and a right ventricle. The left ventricle pumps blood to our uh, head and to our feet and everywhere in between except the lungs. 
So the right ventricle, the right-sided heart, pumps blood to the lungs where it can pick up oxygen for in our blood and then circulate it to the left side and then throughout the rest of the body. Now our, our heart was designed brilliantly because it has valves in it that kind of serve like doors or windows that keep air flowing in the right direction or prevent air flowing in the wrong direction. And so these valves prevent blood from going backwards and it helps the pump become more efficient. It also has a blood supply. It has its own plumbing. So it, it has a plumbing system, a valve system, and it has an electrical system. Now the valve system, or excuse me, the plumbing system, thank you. The plumbing system actually is these are the coronary arteries that come off the front of the heart. So it comes off of the aorta, which is this big red blood vessel here attached to the heart that looks like a candy cane. But the coronary arteries come off right down through there, and there's one that goes down the front of the heart, and there's another that wraps around the side of the heart to the left side, and then there's one that wraps around to the right side that runs right down this groove and back around behind the heart. And when those get blocked, that's how heart attacks typically happen. Now our heart also has an electrical system, so it's really important. Sometimes we need an electrician, sometimes we need a plumber, sometimes we need a carpenter. So uh, it's important to, uh, to appreciate these things because it can be very complicated. So the electrical system is built-in wiring, nervous, nervous t uh, nerve tissue that's embedded within our heart muscle that helps electricity flow through that causes our heart to beat. And a typical heart beats about 60 to 100 beats a minute. Sometimes faster, sometimes slower. So when the heart muscle gets a blockage downstream, blood flow can't get around if it happens uh, you know, very quickly on. But heart disease often happens slowly where the cholesterol gets deposited in the blood vessels and it slowly accumulates over time. And when it accumulates slowly over time, just like when a beaver puts a dam in a river, the body, like the river, learns to, to grow channels around that blockage. And so if it happens slowly over time, sometimes we don't know it because our body has developed little tiny channels that go around these blockages. Now, some of the differences between men and women, there's a, a, a disease called microvascular disease which means that we have main highways and, and uh, roads that are the coronary arteries. They're the big blood vessels that come right off the body. So if we scroll back, we have these main blood vessels that go on the outsides of our heart. But then if you notice, they send, a li they send these little smaller branches that penetrate into the heart muscle. And these smaller penetrating blood vessels can get blockages too. So sometimes we have problems with blockages in the main blood vessels or the main roads, like having a construction on 371, and then you can just jump off on some of the side roads and zip around them, uh, around the blockages. Well, we can have blockages in the side roads too. Now, when we do angiograms, which are a procedure where we, we go in to look at these arteries or these blockages, we can see the big blood vessels really well and we have things designed to get into those blood vessels and open them up if they're blocked. When we start talking about these side branches, we don't, they're, they're very tiny. They can be microscopic and less than even a millimeter and hard to see. And we don't have the right tools yet to be able to optimally open those up. So one thing that can happen more commonly in women is coronary microvascular disease where the main roads are wide open but the tiny side roads can get blocked. And when that happens, um, it can cause chest pain and shortness of breath and chest tightness, just like a blockages in the main blood vessels. And we treat it a little bit differently. Sometimes, usually in these cases, we have to use medication to treat it, to try to help uh, make these blood vessels dilate or get bigger to help improve blood flow with nitroglycerin or other medicines like nitroglycerin. So now, one thing we know is that the chances of coronary disease increase with birthdays. So never blow out those birthday candles and you'll be just fine. <laughs> so we know that coronary disease is very uncommon in people who are aged 54, you know, less than 54 and or less, you know, 40s or in, in their 50s. But as, as we 
have birthdays, the chances of us having heart disease go up. And heart disease can mean coronary disease where there's a blockage, it can mean heart failure, it can mean stroke, uh, or it can mean uh, intermittent claudication or, or pain in our legs when we walk or from blood vessel blockages in our legs. Now, we know that with age, we also increase the risk of heart attacks. That's what a myocardial infarction means. The, blue, the women are in red here and the men are in blue. And we know as we age, the chances of having a heart attack are greater in men than women, but the, the risk goes up with each decade of life. When we talk about sudden death, meaning who dies, uh, in, in an emergency when they're having a heart attack, um, women die a little bit less often than men, about half as, half as often. Uh, but we know that the chances of dying from a heart attack can increase with age. Now I'm not up here to, to be talking about doom and gloom today. We're gonna talk about some, some things that we can do to help decrease this risk over time. Um, so we, in order to do that, we need to know, well, what are the risk factors to the, that, that uh, we can work on or what are the risk factors that put us at risk for developing heart disease or, or coronary artery disease blockages, uh, so to speak. We know that blood pressure plays a big role and that's why we check it in the clinic every, every time a person comes into clinic and we're constantly asking, well, what's your blood pressure been at home? Has it been high? Has it been low? We know that blood pressure is, it plays a role in, in the development of cholesterol deposits in any blood vessels, whether it's in the head uh, or the neck or the legs or around the heart. The other thing that we pay close attention to is cholesterol. Now when we do a cholesterol check, we typically check a couple things. We don't just check uh, the total cholesterol, but we also check the sub-cholesterol levels like uh, HDL or, or the high density lipoprotein or healthy cholesterol. We also check the LDL which is the bad cholesterol and then we check triglycerides which are kind of like the building blocks for cholesterol and those can be excellent, some can be high, some can be low. Generally speaking total cholesterol we like to see that number less than 200. Uh, the triglycerides we usually like to see that less than about 150 and then the HDL we like to see greater than 40. Some of the things that can raise those numbers, we like to see that number higher, um, is exercise. Exercise can raise that number. And then the last one, LDL, that's the bad cholesterol. We like to see that kind of low, the, you know, lower the better. And you know, there's not a, a definite cutoff where we say this is an absolute where we need to work to get this down to this level. But when I've been at conferences talking with national leaders and people who help, develop guidelines for cholesterol, they think the LDL cholesterol back in, in you know, 200 years ago or so when we didn't have McDonald's and other, other uh, habits, the LDL normal cholesterol was about 35 or 40. And so most, most people I would bet have an LDL level over 100 unless, there's, uh, unless they're on a cholesterol medicine. Uh, diabetes. So diabetes is a risk factor um, and it can be, uh, you know, something, diabetes is where we have increased blood sugar in, uh, and, and we have troubles uh, with some uh, either insulin, we don't make enough insulin from our pancreas or sometimes our, the building blocks that process the, the uh, sugar that gets sugar in our bodies doesn't, it doesn't, uh, is desensitized to insulin and insulin doesn't work well uh, sometimes. And so there's some tricks that we can use with diabetes medicines to help, uh, help us process sugar better. Uh, but we know that it's certainly a risk factor for, for heart disease. Uh, family history, so we always ask, you know, tell us about your, your family, your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters. The first degree relatives are usually the most important in terms of crystal balls, looking, looking into the future. What are some of the things that we, that we you know, may be affected by that have affected our other family members? And sometimes things run in the family, sometimes not. Um, but generally speaking, when we think about coronary disease, we're, we're really wondering, has, did your dad or mom or brother, or did your dad or your brothers have a heart attack before age 50? And you know, did your mom or your sisters have a heart attack before age 60? Those seem to be risk factors for developing uh, heart disease. And then lastly, smoking. Um, 
smoking is, is one of the accelerants of coronary disease. And so smoking can, can cause a lot of problems, but it, ca it can cause a lot of problems with the heart. And it, it seems to increase the, the rate at which uh, plaque develops inside the blood vessels. And there was an inter interesting study that in Scandinavia that looked at the age uh, of a person's first heart attack in women. And what they found was that in one study, smokers uh, versus non-smokers had a had a almost 20 year difference in when they had their first heart attack. So smoking, uh, p females who smoked in a Scandinavian country like Norway or Sweden had a heart attack at age 60 whereas those who didn't had their first heart attack at about age 79. Well, what are some of the risk factors that are unique to women? Um, preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is something that can affect pregnant women. Uh, women who are who are carrying a baby can sometimes develop high blood pressure uh, during pregnancy. And I don't see any pregnant women in the room today. <laughs> but preeclampsia is something that, that we've, we've appreciated over the last 10 or so years that can, it is a risk factor for developing heart disease. So the other thing that, that is unique to women that, that doesn't affect men is gestational diabetes. So that means that during pregnancy, some women develop high blood pressure, some women develop diabetes only during pregnancy. And that can be a risk factor as well. Now, these are not absolutes. So not everybody who develops preeclampsia gets heart disease, and not everybody who develops gestational diabetes gets heart disease, and not everybody who develops you know, diabetes or high blood pressure gets heart disease. So there are a multitude of other factors that, that play a role here. Uh, and then lastly, preemies have an increased risk of heart disease as well. So my, I have two, three kids that were born before age or before uh, 37 weeks uh, of pregnancy, and, and so they're at a slightly increased risk of heart disease. So unique risk factors for, for women. So uh, postmenopause, the, the, the incre there's an increased rate of heart disease after menopause, and and we think that that uh, uh, estrogen. Uh, to some extent can be protective of, of heart disease or protective from heart disease. And so people who go through early menopause may be at a slightly increased risk of heart disease. Now we used to prescribe estrogen for everybody, right? And then all of a sudden uh, we, said, we, just, we found out that it wasn't as good because it, it can cause heart attacks. And so then we took all the estrogen away and, and I'm sure it angered a lot of people <laughs> with, with symptoms of, of uh, menopause. Uh, but but uh, Menopause or pre-menopause can be protective. Estrogen can be protective. Uh, uh, and so we know that, that people who have a hysterectomy and have their, the ovaries taken out too are at, are at an increased risk of heart disease. Uh, and then inflammatory rheumatic diseases. So that would be things like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Sjogren's syndrome, con uh, other connective tissue diseases like scleroderma, mixed connective tissue disease, kind of some, some things that are less common. Uh, can increase risk of heart disease too because there's some inflammation throughout the body that can affect the blood vessels. And when there's inflammation in the blood vessels, uh, more cholesterol can accumulate there. So what are the symptoms of a heart attack? When do I need to pay attention? And when do I need to, when should I call? And you know, do I wanna, I don't wanna be the person who cries wolf all the time. You know, when should I pay attention and when should I, when should I just uh, hunker down and ignore things? Or when should I just go to, go to sleep and sleep it off, so to speak? Well, chest pain, pressure, or tightness at rest or with exertion when you're exercising or vacuuming or climbing the stairs or doing things that you normally do and, and, but you're having symptoms doing those, that's out of the ordinary, those would be red flags to, to uh, talk to your doctor about. Shortness of breath. That's a classic symptom of, of, of uh, heart disease or heart failure. Um, and it can, shortness of breath can happen at rest or when a person lays down to sleep at night um, or waking up in the middle of the night short of breath or maybe just with activity. You know, just when you walk uptown to get the mail or, or walk it around in the grocery store or climb a flight of stairs. And then other things that can sometimes go with the, any of these symptoms is upset stomach vomiting, and sometimes profuse sweating. Um, those can kind of intermittently come along with it. Now, this is a, 
I think we had uh, we have some flyers on the back that have that have this poster in bigger form. They're easier to read from a distance. But heart attack symptoms for women, so they're a little bit different. And so women don't often or don't necessarily uh, as often get chest pain or chest pressure or chest tightness, but more so common things like shortness of breath or shoulder blade pain or pain in the elbows. I've, I, I have one patient in particular, the only time uh, she gets any pain from her heart, her elbows hurt. I have no good explanation for it, but, but it, it's happened time and time again. And so we, we pay close attention to signs and symptoms that aren't maybe as classic as what we were taught in medical school. You know, because what we were taught in medical school was that if someone's having a heart attack, they're going to have chest pain. That's not always the case. Sometimes the only symptom is, you know, shortness of breath or having really uh, struggling to, to breathe. So, what is our risk of having a heart attack? Well, it just so happens that there's a risk calculator that everybody has in front of them. You can go home tonight and you can jump on the internet or you can, if you have a smartphone, there's an app that you can Google and put it, or that you can search for to put this app in your phone if you're, if you're app savvy. And it's called the ASCVD Risk Calculator. ASCVD stands for Atherosclerotic Cardiovascular Disease. And you can Google just ASCVD Risk Calculator, or the website is right on these sheets of paper right at the bottom, and you can calculate what your risk of having a heart attack is in the next 10 years. And so when we look at these risk calculators, so this is the same thing that's on the, on the, on the uh, screen right now. And so we punch in information like age, blood pressure, total cholesterol, HDL, which is the healthy cholesterol, the blood pressure, Systolic blood pressure is that first number of your blood pressure. That's the pressure when your heart beats, that, that pressure that's exerted on the blood vessel walls. And then the diastolic blood pressure is the pressure exerted when your heart is relaxing because your heart beats and then it has to relax to fill up with blood. And so there's two pressures that we have with a blood pressure. And then the, the other thing is, are you treated for high blood pressure? So do you take a blood pressure medicine? Do you have diabetes and do you currently smoke? And then if you hit the calculate button on there, it will pull up what your risk is and it'll pop it up into a, a menu usually at the top of the page. If, if you want to be a little, if you want to take it to the next level, there's something on the back side called the MESA risk calculator. And this looked at tens of thousands of people over the long term, you know, many years, and figured out what are the what are the risks, what are the big risk factors that we need to follow, and the one thing that this Mesa risk calculator added is the coronary calcium score. Now, does anybody know what their coronary calcium? Has anyone ever had a coronary calcium scan? So I see one person in the room. So all right, I'm glad I'm here today. So coronary calcium is is a, is a test that we sometimes do to look at the coronary arteries. It's a non-contrast chest CT uh, that allows us to look right into the coronary arteries and see is there calcium. Now calcium, so th there's a picture of what calcium looks like on this brochure. Calcium is cholesterol. It's soft cholesterol that is remodeled over time to calcium which is is like bone. And so calcium shows up as white specks in the coronary arteries. And what we do is we calculate how much calcium is in the coronary arteries. And we use that score to help risk stratify or determine who's at high risk and who's at low risk of having heart, of a heart attack. Now that's probably one of the, it, it is the best test we have to predict future events. A coronary calcium score of zero, meaning there's no coronary calcium in the arteries or the coronary arteries, means that the risk of having a heart attack in the next 10 years is 0.1%.
So I like to use this in patients who say, you know, I don't really want to be on a cholesterol medicine. I'm having side effects. Do I need to be on it? Do I need to gut it out and take it? That's one of the times where I pull out the coronary calcium test and I check, do you have heart disease or not? And, and I can count a, you know, a dozen or more times where I've stopped the, the, the cholesterol medicine because a person has a coronary calcium score of zero, which means they're at very low risk of having a heart attack or having a problem in the next 10 years. Now, why do we like cholesterol medicines? Why do we push cholesterol medicines on everybody? It's because it decreases the risk of heart attack and stroke and it cuts it down by about 30 to 36 percent. We would put it in the water supply if the city councils would let us. <laughs> Recognizing that not everybody tolerates it though. So how can I cut my risk for heart disease? So knowing our risk factors, knowing our numbers, knowing our cholesterol numbers, our blood pressure numbers, uh, knowing what our family history is if we can, and then Obviously doing things like that can help prevent uh, heart disease from happening, changing some behaviors if we, if we smoke to try to quit smoking. If we're inactive, finding ways to, to create more activity in our lives. And then knowing your numbers, so ABCs. So we're gonna move into what ABCs stand for. So know your ABCs. So A is for aspirin. Aspirin uh, is, is uh, useful for anybody who's had a history of coronary disease, meaning anyone who's had stents or bypass surgery or knows that they have some coronary disease, meaning is there calcium in the arteries or do you have any lumps or bumps in the coronary arteries from an angiogram in the past. You know, we can determine if there's some coronary calcium in there, either from a coronary calcium scan or a lot of people have had chest CT scans for other reasons, maybe a pneumonia, maybe to look at for fluid in the lungs, for various reasons. And, and I'll often look back and through the imaging that people have had and look, have you had a CT scan before? And is there calcium there? If, there's, if I look back and find a, a CT scan and there's no calcium, um, then that's a great sign that there's probably no major coronary disease present. Anyone who's had a history of a stroke or a, a mini stroke called a TIA, we generally recommend aspirin as well. And then anyone based on that risk calculator who has a risk greater than 10% in the next 10 years of having a heart attack, we would often recommend aspirin. Blood pressure, so A is aspirin. Very important for some people, not, a, not everyone. This is not a one size fits all. There's sometimes reasons not to be on an aspirin. Uh, especially if someone has maybe had uh, you know, stomach ulcers, for instance, or bleeding problems. Um, and it's just a baby aspirin when we talk about it, baby aspirin. A baby aspirin is 81 milligrams, so not a full strength aspirin. We know that we think that full strength aspirins will increase the risk of bleeding without any added benefit. Um, however, there's a big study that's going to be enrolling soon across the country that's going to look at thousands of patients over the next several years to, to, to help us figure out is 81 milligrams the right dose. So A is for aspirin, B is for blood pressure, and JNC7 is just a joint national council, the seventh meeting of, of world experts where they review all the data from blood pressure uh, research studies and try to help figure out what should the guidelines be. Well, it so happens that there was an update to this uh, and I almost didn't update my slide, but fortunately I caught this last night. So the goal blood pressure, now it was published back in November and it was on NBC News and various news networks. The guidelines have changed for blood pressure. Now we, we work on a blood pressure goal of trying to get down to less than 130 over 80 if possible. Appreciating that sometimes it's not always possible because of side effects from some uh, of the blood pressure medicines. So. C is, so A is aspirin, B is blood pressure, C is cholesterol. So cholesterol management. So taking a statin medication, that would be like Lipitor or Crestor or Zocor, Pravastatin, uh, Lovastatin, it can reduce the chance of having a heart attack for people who are at risk of heart attacks and strokes. And those people who are at higher risk for heart attacks and strokes include people who have diabetes, uh, have a high total cholesterol of greater than 200, uh, or have a history of 
having problems with the blood, blood vessel blockages like coronary disease or having stents put in or bypass surgery or having a history of a, a stroke. So statin medication, so it, it affects, we know that some people can't tolerate cholesterol medicines, about 5 to 10% of people. So about 1 in, five, 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 people have bad side effects from statin medications. We know, we, we know that, that, that some people can't tolerate it. Um, but it's a really important medicine if you can because it can decrease your risk of heart attack by about Two to, by about 31 percent. So, and and when I say heart attack, I mean dying from a heart attack, by 31 percent. So one in three, it'll decrease your risk. In adults who have increased risk, uh, but have never had a, a heart attack before, it'll decrease the risk of death. It'll decrease the risk of stroke by about 29 percent, and it'll decrease the risk of heart attack by about 36 percent. So 36% decrease in the risk of a heart attack. Would anybody like to not have a heart attack? <laughs> so I would guess everybody would raise their hand. So it's a really helpful thing. Now, we're gonna move on to the S. S is smoking. Now, we used to recommend smoking, for goodness sakes. So things have changed. You know, some of the things that we prescribed or recommended in decades past, we don't do now. We know. Better. We know that, that certain things can cause problems, such as smoking. We know that, that more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> so this is a real ad in, in a magazine, and I think it was from like the 1930s or 40s. So it wasn't too, too long ago. Now, when I was running th through an airport trying to catch a flight in, uh, I can't remember which airport I was in, I came across this ad in, or this, this was on cigarettes. It had the, whatever, whatever place I was at rec, you know, required that this be on cigarettes to help decrease the chances of younger people starting smoking. And so we know that it clogs arteries, we know that it can cause heart attacks, and we know that, that it causes nine out of 10 lung cancers. And uh, smoking increased the risk of heart disease and stroke by about two to four times. So if, if a person smokes or if you know anybody that smokes, encourage them to quit. And there's lots of different uh, ways to quit nowadays. We used to have to just do it the old-fashioned way with willpower and, and quit cold turkey. But now there's lots of different things. So take a minute, look at your goals, look at your performance, and see if your behavior matches your goals. All right, now sometimes the cat's out of the bag. So if you've had a heart attack before, there are certain things that are important. Taking, medi taking the medications that are prescribed, unless you're having side effects from them. We know that about 30 to 50% of people don't take their medications correctly or, or don't take them at all. So um, medications only help if they make it into your stomach. <laughs> so they don't do any good on the, bed, on the, on the, the uh, nightstand. Um, if you've had a heart attack, it's important to follow up with your doctor for, you know, long term. Um, I, I just saw somebody the other day that had a bypass surgery back in 2002 and hadn't seen a cardiologist in, since then. And so there's, there's certain things that can be done to help prevent problems down the road. I think follow up is a good idea. Um, part participating in cardiac rehab. Has anybody ever done cardiac rehab in here? So cardiac rehab, very helpful. So after a heart surgery, like a valve uh, procedure or a bypass surgery or stenting uh, to the arteries, cardiac rehab will decrease the risk of death compared to people who don't go through it. So it's a really helpful thing. Um, and it's, it's not, it, was anybody, did anybody have a bad experience at cardiac rehab? Yeah, so it, it, there's a lot of good things that can come out of cardiac rehab. It's, it's kind of a structured exercise program where you learn about, learn more about the heart, learn more about eating, diet, learn about uh, medications, good, the bad, and the good medications and medications to avoid. You learn about how your heart responds to exercise early on after, after having a, a heart procedure too. Um, managing risk factors, so you know, 
if, if a person goes through bypass surgery and is, and is uh, still smoking, that might be a great opportunity to, to help cut back on cigarettes or, or, and quit. And then lastly, get support. So there's support groups that are out there that can help uh, where you can talk to other people that have had gone through similar trials and tribulations uh, that, you, that you're going through you know, now or in the future. So certain, we're going to change, change uh, uh, topics here a little bit, and we're going to talk a, a, about certain heart diseases that can affect women more so than men. So stress cardiomyopathy, or broken heart syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, so a couple people raised their hand. I see multiple people. So, um, so it's a very common thing that we'll dive into. And then pulmonary arterial hypertension. Has anyone ever heard of that? Great. I tell you what, five years ago if I was giving this talk, nobody would have heard of it. So this is great that, that people have heard of these. So broken heart syndrome, it's also, it's got a multitude of names. So that's what we do in medicine. We name things and then we rename them a bunch of different things. And same thing with medicines. We, give one, we don't give one name, we give multiple names. And it's confusing. And I think it's, we do that for job security, so not everybody can be a doctor. So this has a, uh, several different names. It's known as broken heart syndrome or apical ballooning syndrome, stress cardiomyopathy, or my favorite, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Takotsubo means octopus trap, and I'll show you why this got labeled as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy in a second. What it means is that all of a sudden, the left ventricle, the main workhorse for the heart, the one that pumps blood throughout the whole body except the lungs, all of a sudden a portion of it goes on strike and quits working well. And it, it often involves the bottom part of that heart. So if we think of our heart like a cone, it's the bottom part of that cone, kind of the apex of the heart. And it can mimic a heart attack. So when people come in with broken heart syndrome, the symptoms and signs are often identical, and sometimes the only way to distinguish it is doing an angiogram, because it looks just like a heart attack. And so people often have chest pain and shortness of breath, and when we do enzyme, when we check for the heart enzymes in the blood, called troponin, it's often positive, just like, it often shows up as, as high, just like a heart attack would. And so people usually move around really fast when you come in with chest pain, and, and that's because they want to make sure that you're not having a heart attack. The EKG, or the electrical wiring, when we check the electrodes and look at the electrical activity, um, it can look just like a heart attack as well. But when someone has an angiogram with broken heart syndrome, the coronary arteries are usually wide open, meaning that they're wide open, there's no blockages, at least in the big arteries that we can see. Oops you got to quit hitting that button. So, it can affect any part of the heart, but it often involves the bottom part. And the reason we call it an octopus trap is because this is the, the kind of the top part of the heart. So we think of the heart sitting like this, and we have the apex down here, and this would be the apex or bottom part of the heart. And this looks like it's stunned, where it's not pumping well. While this part is pumping a lot, it's pumping really vigorously, and so it, clamp, it looks like an octopus trap where this balloons out, and this stays about, this just uh, looks like it's working really hard. About one to two patients, one to two percent of patients that present with a certain type of heart attack called a STEMI, or an ST elevation heart attack, have broken heart syndrome. It's much more common in women than men. It affects, uh, when we look at all people who've had, who have broken heart syndrome, about 80% are women. And the average age is about 66 years old. So it can affect, and, and I've seen people who are in their 40s who've had this. Um, most common sign and symptom, chest pain. Almost everybody has some chest pain, shortness of breath, and some people even pass out. It can look just like heart failure, where people go into heart shock, where the heart pumping function all of a sudden just quits working. And some people even pass out and need CPR. 10% of patients who have signs and symptoms of heart shock, uh, with low blood pressure, cold hands and feet, 
breathing distress and confusion. And it's all because the heart isn't able to pump as much blood around. What causes broken heart syndrome? So it's usually due to either physical or emotional stress. Physical, I've seen it after surgery. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was down at Mayo Clinic taking care of people with liver transplants, liver transplant seems to, this happens uh, somewhat more commonly after a liver transplant, but it can happen after any surgery that someone goes through. Um, it can happen with sepsis or a bloodstream infection. And we sometimes see it with, pay, with people who like to use methamphetamines or cocaine. Um, emotional triggers. So it's called broken heart syndrome because uh, cardiologists recognize that when people were going through a big emotional stress such as a divorce or bankruptcy or the death of a loved one, um, the heart uh, can, can or this can happen to the heart and that's why it's called broken heart syndrome. And I, it can happen repeatedly. For instance, um, a, someone I know who, whose uh, son died, developed broken heart syndrome soon thereafter because uh, it was unexpected and, and uh, very sudden. And on the anniversary, she's had it again, multiple times. So it, it can be, uh, it, there's some sort of, of uh, relationship between the emotional trigger 29% of patients have no trigger at all, so we can't tell what's going on there. Um, we don't really understand fully what causes it or how to prevent it, uh, but it can be treatable. We think it might have to do with stress hormones that our adrenal glands uh, produce. Our adrenal glands are, sit on top of our kidneys and produce hormones, and we think it has to do with the adrenaline that that produces. Um, and we think that it might affect the tiny little blood vessels and cause them to spasm a little bit, almost like a muscle cramp. And when they spasm, blood can't get through there as easily. Now, we also think that there may be a role with estrogen and estrogen receptors because it affects more women than men. Yet to be determined on that. Um, how do we treat it? It often resolves quickly. Uh, people develop heart failure with this uh, and it often goes away after a couple days or several weeks. We use medications, we try to avoid dehydration and we use medicines, sometimes we give fluids to help, help uh, prevent low blood pressure during this event. And then we also use medications like metoprolol or lisinopril or losartan to help promote the heart to recover uh, pumping function. Now, I'm gonna shift gears again so if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. So Yogi Berra said this. I, he, is a, he was a, a comedian. He was a baseball player. And uh, I, had, I was lucky enough to meet him when I was little. And I didn't even recognize how, how, what, what a neat guy he was. Uh, but awesome guy. So he came to Fargo one time for a golf tournament. And, and I, my dad brought me there to meet him. And I got his autograph. And I had no clue who he was. When I was, it was when I was like six or eight. So now I knew, now I know though. So uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So what is pulmonary arterial hypertension? It is a disease that affects the blood vessels through the lungs and it affects more women than men, about four times more women than men. And we know that uh, it's a very somewhat rare disease. It's about 10 and 50, it affects about 10 to, to 52 people per million or so we think, or so we thought, I should say. Uh, and it affects about 70 to 80 percent of, of, it affects, 70 to 80 percent of people affected are women compared to men. It's, it's uncommon in men, but it can happen. Now, we used to think that it was a rare disease. In fact, in medical school, um, we can't learn about a lot. There's a lot of things we don't learn much about because we don't have time. I, I would still be in medical school if, I, if we were learning about everything possible. So we learn about the, the most common things and then we pick up things along the way. When I was in medical school, uh, I learned about 30 seconds worth of information on pulmonary arterial hypertension. <laughs> and it just so happens that after medical school, I went, when I was at my very first week, almost my very first night on call uh, in Rochester, who do you think I admitted to the hospital? Someone with pulmonary arterial hypertension. And I had no idea what to do. And so I had to read about it. 
and I read and I read and I read. And then I was lucky enough that the, the cardiologist I was working with shows up in the morning and he's the world's expert on it. And so that's why she was admitted and I didn't know that. But he taught me a lot about it and, and it's something that I've, I've uh, taken to heart and learned as much as I could about because so, so that way I would never be surprised by it again. Um, and I know how to treat people who have pulmonary t uh, hypertension. And, and I've done some research now and done research in our area up in Brainerd. And what we have found is that this is way more common than 10 to 52 people per million because I take care of uh, about 40 people just around the Brainerd, Aiken, Crosby, uh, Staples area that have pulmonary arterial hypertension. And we don't have a million population. And so, I, you know, we, we have a population of about, you know, 60 to 100,000 people maybe in the surrounding area, 60 mile radius. And so this is something that I think that we haven't appreciated over time and we're finding that it's more common now. And so uh, we started a clinic uh, to, to help care for people with pulmonary hypertension in this area. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, a disease that affects these tiny little blood vessels that come off of the right heart. So the right heart on, this, on our brochure, on our anatomy brochure, is connected to the right ventricle. And so it's this right ventricle on the right side of our, our uh, page that connects to this tree trunk called the pulmonary artery. And then this pulmonary artery branches out like a tree. And the branches keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they find these, these tiny micromillimeter blood vessels. And if we took all those blood vessels out and put them on a tennis court, or excuse me, if we took them all out, it would fill up a whole tennis court. So if we took out all the blood vessels in our lungs and opened them up, it would fill up a tennis court. So there's a lot of blood vessels there that wrap around our air sacs, and that's how oxygen gets into our lungs, or into our blood vessels. These blood vessels, over time, can remodel, and when they remodel in pulmonary hypertension, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they get kind of, it's like pruning a tree, and you prune all the big branches, and all you're left with are tiny little branches. And it can make the blood flow through these areas very difficult. And so this is an example of what a normal blood vessel would look like. It's got a several different layers. It's, a mu it's got a muscular layer, and then it's got a tiny, thin little internal layer. And these, are, these blood vessels are usually very, very thin blood vessels because oxygen has to go across this. Oxygen kind of dissolves right through the blood vessel wall into our blood vessels from our air sacs. What happens with pulmonary hypertension is that these blood vessels can remodel over time and when they remodel, they get thicker and thicker. And it, all of a sudden the oxygen has to try to dissolve through a really thick maze of tissue, scar tissue and stuff. And it can make it really hard for the blood oxygen to get into those blood vessels. And this is just an example of what these look like. This is what a normal blood vessel looks like, nice and thin walled. This is what a blood vessel looks like when it's affected by pulmonary hypertension. There's remodeling that happens where the blood vessel gets really thick and it makes it really hard and it can be, make it really hard to breathe and people often have shortness of breath, lightheadedness, dizziness, sometimes chest pain or pressure. And we can check for this with a heart ultrasound. That's usually the first indication that someone may have pulmonary hypertension is when there's uh, increased blood pressure in the lungs. Now we're going to change gears. Does anybody know who Huey Lewis is? So he was a singer in the band, Huey Lewis and the News. And he, he came out with a, a song called, I Want a New Drug. And so some of the quote from the song is, I want a new drug, one that won't make me sick, one that won't make me crash my car, or make my head three feet thick. And so some medicines are worse than the disease, right? Some medicines make us feel worse than, than how we felt before. And those medicines usually aren't good medicines to stay on long term then. So why am I talking about medicine is because there are some medicines that we know women do better with than men. They help more women than men. And pravastatin is one of those medicines that we know that women uh, who take pravastatin are more less likely to have a heart attack compared to men. And there's other, that's the pravastatin is a cholesterol medicine. And we have a lot of different cholesterol medicines. But this just highlights that pravastatin in women works better than pravastatin in men. 
Now, that doesn't mean everybody in the room who's a woman should stop their cholesterol medicine and switch to pravastatin, but this highlights the fact that some, some medicines are better for women than men. So, I've rambled on long enough. I want to hear some questions, um, but I want to you know, kind of summarize what we've talked about. So, symptoms can vary between men and women. Men sometimes have chest pain, pressure, tightness for heart attacks. Women sometimes have shortness of breath, shoulder blade pain, kind of real subtle symptoms. Uh, know your numbers, ABCs, you know, aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol. And then you can take steps to lower your risk of heart disease and you can calculate what your risk of heart disease is. Now, we often do that in the clinic. You can ask your doctor to help you fill that out at your next clinic visit and they'll call me and thank me for that. Uh, because, it, but it's, I think it's really helpful, it, you know, to help figure out, do, am I at risk or not? You know, how can I cut my risk down? And then lastly, certain cardiovascular diseases are more common in, in uh, women and, and some are more common in men. So, St. Francis uh, said it right by, by uh, this quote, I think. Start by doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you're doing the impossible. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming out, and I want to thank uh, Horizon Health for the invitation to, to speak today, and I'd like to open it up for any questions. Mm -hmm.